Helping Women Proposal Writing Workshop. So I'll give a brief intro about Women Mentoring Women program. And for that, I need to share my screen. My screen visible for everyone? Okay, so a warm welcome to everyone for this Women Mentoring Women in uh, Proposal Writing Workshop presented by IDEA. Women Mentoring Women is a one of a kind initiative under IDEA GRSSS and where a group of women are tirelessly working to empower women initiatives. It's a program by women and exclusively for women. We have one-to-one -one mentorships where it's a completely voluntary program where you can sign up as a mentor or a mentee and uh, the best thing about it is that at times during your PhD or master's whatever program you're in you need a different kind of mentorship which you're not getting from the program that you're enrolled in in a university or school and you can sign up with us with your requirements and we'll try to match up with someone who can meet your requirements we also host skill building and professional development workshops and this proposal writing workshop is actually a part of that. We are planning a series of such workshops and we are also continuously working towards community building and networking opportunities, which is very, very important uh, these days. And uh, that was a short intro on women mentoring women. And uh, the email ID of Margo is given here. If anyone wants to sign up as a mentor or a mentee, you can reach out to her. And uh, if you are interested about women mentoring women or anything about idea or, or specific, specifically women mentoring women, you can drop a mail to her and all of us will be here to guide you all through anything that you need. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our storyteller today of proposal writing, Paul Propster. I would like to give a short introduction of Paul. Paul Propster is a seasoned storyteller and strategy enthusiast with over 25 years of experience in strategic communications. His expertise spans various industries from small women-owned business to energy, technology, and even NASA. In his role as a storytelling uh, architect for NASA's Jet Propulsion Labs office for formulation since 2014, Paul has been instrumental in cultivating a storytelling culture and implementing methods and tools to engage stakeholders emotionally. He has forged strategic partnerships with renowned entities like Disney, Pixar, The Groundlings, Netflix, and Marvel to enhance storytelling practices. Paul's leadership has resulted in successful capture of significant missions such as MAIA, Sunrise, and Sparks. In 2020, he established JPL Story Lab, a pioneering new approach to narrative thinking within JPL teams. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Paul and hope you all enjoy our workshop. I will Thanks, Kubali. share. <laughs> all right. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, at least good morning for me. Um, <laughs> and uh, let me, I'll share my screen and we'll just dive right in here. Okay. All right. So yeah, so we're going to just uh, spend some time together kind of talking about um, the power of story in uh, proposal writing. And um, the couple things that we're going to touch on, right? So here's kind of just our kind of our overview slide here. And so um, we're gonna we're gonna kind of talk through these things, right? So um, your stakeholders, uh, your reviewers, right, can can feel uh, a little bit of your idea, right? So that's emotional investment. We're gonna talk about how to build that. Um, and then also um, believe it, right? Is it familiar and easy to understand? So we're going to talk about things about, you know, how what we do is pretty complex and how can we still communicate that in a clear, compelling way. And also this idea of the curse of knowledge and how to kind of overcome that um, in your in your proposals and in your story. Um, and then, you know, hopefully the combination of those things will help create some visual images in the mind of your stakeholders, right? And then the, the idea would be that they're able to retain it and then repeat it as, you know, there's the review board and they hand it up to the selection official. Okay. All right. And, um, you know, of course we want to make some kind of uh, impact, right. Or have them take some sort of action towards our idea. And so we kind of um, 
look at story as a lens to identify what's important, right? What's at stake, you know, kind of why you are doing what you're doing, right? The kind of work you're doing, why is now important? And then of course, how will it change us, right? What, what you're doing, how, excuse me, how will it add to the community's knowledge? Okay, so storytelling is what we're here to talk about. And we're gonna kind of talk about it in three these three areas, right? We're a little bit about the science of story and how uh, neuroscience has kind of proven that we're sort of hardwired for story as humans. And then we're gonna talk about uh, a couple of ways to think differently about how to tell your story in your proposal. And then we're gonna do a little exercise from our friends over at Pixar, right? To kind of maybe help you kind of zone in on your core story, which could then lend to creating a little elevator pitch, right? Which then could maybe lead to your executive summary or your intro uh, to your proposal. Okay, so um, what, you know, you heard from uh, my, my PI, I'm, I'm the co-I, you heard from uh, my PI, Christina Ricci uh, last week. And, um, you know, so you know that uh, a lot of what we're talking about is based on the work we do with NASA, uh, especially roses. And so in this case, right, NASA is our client, and uh, NASA wants to go to all these amazing uh, places um, like icy worlds. And uh, but in this universe of what ifs, right, how do those reviewers um, pick, you know, this or that concept, right, or research? And it really has turned into a competition of ideas. And um, and to kind of understand how they're going to evaluate those ideas, we'll take a look at a, a high level look at what um, most calls, what we call their evaluation criteria. So when a ROSES call comes out or uh, NSF, et cetera, there's usually some criteria that they state in that call as to um, what they're going to evaluate your idea on. And so, um, We've taken a look at these, right? And a lot across the board. And so here's what we've kind of discovered is what NASA values in most of their calls is the science story. About 70% of those evaluation criteria are around your story, right? The compelling nature, the programmatic value, okay? And about 30% is about the, your technical approach, uh, your management approach, and of course your cost and, and schedule. But what we tend to run into, especially here at the lab, is we kind of flip that, right? Because we're a bunch of engineers and, and scientists. And so, you know, we tend to, oh, we, we can wait on the story, but, you know, what's our technical approach and, and who's our management team? And can we get into the, into the uh, cost bucket, right? And so we, we, we tend to flip that. And so just want to let you know that this is kind of the opposite way of the way NASA kind of looks at your proposal and your story. Okay, so at JPL, you know, we were the center that probably um, submits the most proposals across the board uh, to headquarters, whether it's the small RNA proposals all the way up to the large, you know, billion dollar class uh, mission proposals. And with that, we get a lot of feedback, which is great. And so um, one of the things we're gonna talk about uh, today is that from all that feedback, right, we have learned um, that the compelling nature or the emotional connection or investment in the idea is critical to the review process, right? And so as that emotional investment grows, that critical assessment um, tends to decrease because again, as we're going to talk about a little bit, um, we're kind of hardwired as humans to learn new information through story. And so that if we can make our science gettable, as our friends at Pixar like to say, um, if we can get them rooting for us from the beginning, they'll become partial to our science and to our idea. And most of these calls have that, you know, science story up front, and then you get into all the kind of technical management stuff that they'll actually be a little less critical because they're already kind of rooting for you, right? Because you've kind of drawn them in with your story. And so we'd like to talk about kind of a real life example of this. And um, so 
this was a concept that JPL um, submitted to NASA's Discovery uh, 2019 <laughs> call. And um, so the way that call works, it, it's, a, it's a planetary call. And so it's about concepts or missions in our solar system. And um, it's about a half a billion dollar um, cost cap. And this concept was a first time idea, right? Hadn't been submitted before. Okay, so right there, there's a little bit more of a challenge. Most proposals um, take about three, I think it's 3.2 times <laughs> to get uh, to get uh, selected, right? So to go in on your first time, that, that, that's, that's tough, that you gotta be a little bold. And um, so let me tell you a little bit about how that evaluation process works. So it's what headquarters calls a two-step process. So step one is a 250-ish um, page proposal. And they're really looking at your science and, you know, of course, your technical approach and your team, et cetera. But they're really kind of looking at the potential for science in your actual concept. And so you want to get from step one into step two. That's the first, that's the first uh, gate. And, um, and then they have these categories of how they rate or evaluate your proposal. And so category one is you are selectable. You, you know, you're in, in, in this, you're in the rare air of being ready to go into step two. Cat two, uh, you still have a possibility. It's, it, 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 it doesn't happen often, but you could get selected, but you've done a great job on your proposal. And that you're just one notch above, uh, below being a category one. Category three is usually you've got a good proposal, but there's some maturity maybe on technology or they want you to reduce some risk. And so a lot of times when you're a cat three, they will give you some funding so you can come back in about four years. Four years is, is about how often this, this call comes out. And they really like your idea. They want to fund you to mature a little bit for the next call. Um, and then category four is kind of that, hey, thanks, thanks for your proposal, but you know, it needs it needs a lot of work. Um, okay. So with that, um, like I said, this is a first time proposal being submitted, uh, a new PI, um, a new idea. And so I want to read you the actual feedback um, on our step one proposal as we were trying to get into step two. Okay. So this approach has significant inherent risk in that, oh, let me describe the mission. Oh my gosh. All right. So <laughs> this was going to be a mission to Neptune's moon Triton. And it's about a 13 year cruise. And uh, the proposal was stating that in one encounter with that body, that they would meet all their science objectives. Okay. And um, they had some uh, cool ideas in there, you know, like we have sunshine, they were going to lean into Neptune shine because it, 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 you know, it lights up because it's such a bright surface, you know, it kind of lights up the moon at certain times when they were going to be doing their observations. So that was their, their thought, you know, 13 year cruise, one encounter, meet all their science objectives. Okay. So they had to kind of convince headquarters that, you know, this was a good thing to do. Um, okay. So here we go. This approach has significant inherent risk in that a single flyby may not collect sufficient observations to achieve all of Trident's objectives, which led to a CAT2 rating, right? So they're, they're just that notch below. However, this weakness is outweighed by the potential for science return, okay? So potential for science return, <clears throat> kind, of, kind of keep that in your minds, you know, what's that potential excitement of what your idea, your research, um, we'll, we'll provide. And then I also wanted to share a quote from Lori Glaze, right, who's the director of SMD's Planetary Science Division, and what she posted via Twitter. So uh, this one, you know, Trident, is to me really, really compelling. Very excited that this mission made it into the top four. So we did get down selected from about 19 to four to go into step two. So just kind of an example of how you can really, uh, if you if you build that emotional investment, if you really are clear about the um, potential excitement of your idea, then you know that that really helps that probability of win uh, to kind of to kind of go up. Okay, and also um, 
feel free to ask questions, you know, um, want this to be as interactive as, as we can. Okay, so we're gonna jump in here with um, our science of story here. Okay, and so, um, oops, so, so humans are curious, okay? And so this is uh, Professor George Lowenstein, right? Um, he's over at uh, Carnegie Mellon, and uh, he's also the director of the Center of Behavioral Decision. So um, our brains become spontaneously curious when presented with an information set that is incomplete. And so a lot of times, right, that's what we're doing with these proposals, right? We're trying to fill a, maybe a knowledge gap um, that can help the community, okay? So we're curious. Um, oh, sorry, and a natural inclination to resolve those information gaps. Okay, humans are creative. Okay, so we start modeling words as soon as we start reading them. So this comes from Benjamin Berger out at uh, UC San Diego, and he directs the language and cognition lab, right? And um, so, you know, he also says, we don't wait till we get to the end of the sentence. This means the order in which we place words matters. Okay, so in this little sentence here, right? Jane gave a kitten to her dad versus Jane gave her dad a kitten. Um, you kind of picture Jane and then you picture the kitten and then her dad kind of mimics the real world action, right? So that's what our brains do. They start modeling that and we are mentally experiencing the scene in the correct sequence. Okay, so we'll talk about that in a little bit about the, the order in which you, you put things. Okay, and then also uh, we're emotional, right? And so this is C.S. Lewis. And uh, so back in 1956, he advised a young writer to show not to tell. Instead of telling us a thing is terrible, describe it so we'll be terrified. Don't say it was delightful, make us say delightful when we've read the description. So again, as you're, you know, keep this in mind as you're writing, um, these are kind of, again, build up that emotional investment and um, help them really kind of get what uh, you're trying to do, okay? All right, and so now we're gonna get a little kind of closer to home. So humans hardwired for story. Uh, this is Kendall Haven, he's, he's a friend of the lab. Uh, Kendall has written a whole stack of books there on, uh, <laughs> on story and, uh, and how um, that can help us as humans learn. And um, so he was recent, we're gonna talk about one study he did for DARPA recently. DARPA asked him two questions. How does the human brain make sense of incoming information and experience? And once it makes sense, how does it then create meaning from that information? Okay, so Kendall took on these two questions. And uh, what he came up with was, was kind of this approach of every communication is an economic event. You want to buy their attention in order to deliver your idea or your concept. They'll pay with their attention to be engaged. So engagement is the gateway to influence, okay? So again, if they're engaged with the with your, your, your thinking right up front, it really helps them to understand your idea or concept. Okay, and then one of the other uh, uh, ideas that came out of his was, uh, it's not, did I say what I wanted to say? It's, did they hear what I need for them to hear? Okay, so this happens, we see this a lot. Um, as we go through our internal review process here at the lab for these proposals, um, we do a mock review about oh, maybe maybe the first quarter, you know, right about the first quarter of the time the team has in their schedule to create the proposal. So we do it relatively early, but we do it because, you know, we want them to understand how their story is developing, how their proposal is reading. And um, I would say 95% of the time, this situation happens where um, the review board, the mock review board has been given um, you know, a day to read everything. And then we come in the next day with the team and they start giving feedback. And, um, and it's usually uh, uh, the engineering side, but sometimes the science side, but, and let's say one of the reviewers says, hey, I don't quite get you know, how you know, your approach to X, Y, Z um, it, it works. And sure enough, the lead system engineer will jump up and say, oh, it's, it's on page 25, the second column, you know, and it talks about it. Did you read that? And we'll, you know, the reviewer will say, I did, and I still don't get it, right? So we're going to talk about how um, 
that maybe help them hear what you intended for them to hear, okay? All right, and then, so the way he kind of framed this, this whole study was that we're physically hardwired to make sense of incoming information and experience in specific story terms or elements. And so he kind of coined this idea of your neural story net. So his research showed that we, we tend to turn incoming information into story before it reaches your conscious mind with your neural story net, okay? So we're gonna do our first little interactive uh, exercise here. And um, so what I'd like everybody to do is, um, let me see here, I'm gonna open up the, the chat as well, um, is we're gonna look at the next slide and just tell me what you think is going on, okay? And you can either just come off mute and say it, or you can type it into the chat, whatever you're most comfortable with. Okay, here we go. Who's the brave soul that wants to start us off here? <laughs> if no one is ready to say anything, I'll say. <laughs> Go ahead, Puval. Yes. Yeah, so we are not sure at this point if these three events are related or not. But as soon as I read the three lines, my brain automatically related that uh, like Sharon was waiting on Fred Ed to get the food and hence and she didn't get the food and she went hungry and wept so it can be unrelated but my brain automatically related that these is this is a sequence of events yeah no thank you Bubali. and uh I, I i don't know if everybody saw what kyle put in the chat but uh, uh <laughs> but i like that kyle um yep steam sharon was waiting for fred yep okay yeah so so thanks, thanks, thanks for those uh, for those thoughts. Yeah, so so we get a lot. Sometimes we get a lot of uh, interesting, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, ideas about what's happening here, and um, and and so the, the example of this, right? So so um, you know, we got that he, you know, maybe Fred fell down a manhole, right? And and Pupali was automatically trying to put it together, and so. What's going on here and what can science tell us about how we are interpreting this information and how we can use that information to tell better stories, right? So as Pali kind of mentioned, you know, our brains are hardwired to do this, to kind of fill in or add information, okay? So you look at these three sentences, they're disjointed and disorganized. And what Kendall calls your neural story net, right, started making certain assumptions about these three sentences in order to make it make sense to you right, as an individual. And so that's our neural story net working to try to bring some connections between these sentences. So the thought here is, you know, imagine you're trying to explain your concept or your idea, you know, people may be interpreting things that aren't necessarily there, okay? So just kind of thinking about that as part of how we want to approach our stories. And then to kind of to kind of wrap this little, little section up here, so what um, uh, Kendall kind of kind of his summary was, you know, uh, we are hardwired for story. And because of that, our neural story net kind of distorts the incoming information in order to make it make sense. Okay. Most times the story they see in here is not the story you said and applying effective story structure can help minimize this type of distortion. Okay, let's now talk a little bit about thinking differently. Okay. So, um, so most of this uh, comes from a couple of places. Uh, the the Aldous uh, Center for Communicating Science. So um, you may know uh, Alan Alda, you know, a famous actor, but he was also a huge science geek. And for quite a few years, he had a series on PBS where he would talk and interview scientists about the work they were doing. And he quickly came to understand that most of them did not really know how to really explain their science um, in an accessible way, 
right? So again, people could understand it. And uh, so he ended up eventually out at Stony Brook University, uh, opened up the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science. Um, a quick little plug here, if, if you ever have an opportunity to go out there for their week long boot camp, um, they are back doing those in person now. Um, I would strongly suggest it if you could uh, swing it, you know, um, I, I would say go out there and, and take that. I and mean, we're going to just pull a few things uh, from that workshop and talk about it. The other stuff, the other input that we're going to talk about comes from our friends over at Disney and Pixar. And so since we're here in uh, Southern California, kind of kind of right in the industry, as they say, um, we're able to reach out to some of these teams and pick their brains a little bit on how to tell better stories. So we'll talk about that as well. Okay, so the, the three things that we're gonna highlight here, or the main thing that when you go to that workshop at the Alda Center is really how to relate to communicate. That's kind of their overall um, strategy. And so relating to your audience, right? Have it, as we talked earlier, having your idea relate to reviewer or stakeholder. So we're just gonna touch on a couple of things here. Uh, one voice, the curse of knowledge and complexity. Okay, so um, we're going to explore something again together. So I need to go to the participant list here. Okay. So um, maybe uh, Margot, you, you can maybe help me out here. Um, so so we need um, so on my list, I'm going to just so we're going to pick out um, four folks here to help us out. Okay, so. Um, on my list, I see, um, let me see, I'm trying to get folks who are, okay, so how about um, Kyle, uh, D Diva, Diva, is that right? Um, Divya? Anush yeah, Divya, yeah, An An Anushri, Anushri? Anushri. Okay, and... Um, and Boris, Boris, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm butchering your names. <laughs> okay, so um, why don't you all come off mute? And if you can, if you can turn your cameras on, that'd be awesome. Um, okay, so everybody's, okay, everybody's up at the top now, I think. All right. Okay, so. What we're going to do, okay, you kind of changed order now a little bit, but that's all right. Um, so what we're going to do is we are going to start with, uh, so on my screen now, it's Anushri, and then Boris, and then um, Kyle, and then, uh, I'm sorry if I'm messing up all your names, <laughs> Stivia, okay? So we're going to start with, um, okay, let me change the slide here. So you have all become a big brain. Okay, one giant brain. Okay, and between the four of you, all right, you are going to one word at a time um, explain photosynthesis to the rest of us. Okay, so the way this is going to work is we're going to start with um, Anushri and work our way to Kyle, right? And then Kyle, we're going to go backwards, right? So uh, uh, I'm sorry, work our way to Divya. Gosh, so. Anushree, Boris, Kyle, Divya, Divya, and then Divya, Kyle, Boris, Anushree. You're going to go back and forth until you feel like you've described photosynthesis, but one word at a time. And when you think you're done, that person can just say period. Okay? Everybody good? Everybody all right? Okay. Start us off. So do we have to just tell one word or can I just explain just it? Just go one, 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 one word. One word. Okay. And then pass uh, it to your partner. Okay. Uh, plant food. Plant. Gather. Oh, Kyle, that's against. Okay. Uh, Divya. Plants gather. Oh, we can't hear. Are, are you? We can't hear you if you're talking. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Oh, shoot, we can't hear you, Divya. Well, um, oh, here we go. She puts sunlight. Okay, so that's a good idea. All right, so plants gather sunlight. Um, over to you, uh, Boris. 
Sorry if I'm not saying that right. Uh, you can hear me clearly. You hear yeah, me? we got it. Okay. Yeah. So I need to describe this picture, right? Uh, photosynthesis. Yep. Yeah. So we've got yeah. plants gather sunlight. Okay, I can say genius, genius. Plants gather sunlight, genus? Genius, yes, exactly. Okay, I'm gonna start to put these. And look in the chat and make sure um, I have this right. Okay, all right. Um, uh, okay, so now back to you, Divya. What do you think is should be the next word here? You can go ahead and put in the chat. Pair. Okay, Kyle. Food. Okay. <laughs> Food. All right. All right, and Anishri. Can I say period? <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Just give them all a hand. Um, all right. So let's talk a little bit about the the uh, the idea behind this exercise, right? So um, a lot of times, especially if you're on a team, right, trying to write your proposal together, um, you need to be really active listeners, right? And be able to take in everybody's ideas and thoughts so you can then put those together and have them come across as, as one voice, right? And so um, not, not to be focused on what you wanna say, but to be focused on what your teammates and others have to say. And so um, without active listening, you know, an idea may not fully, um, fully mature, right? Or, or fully develop. And then the other piece, uh, nobody really um, uh, said one of these words, but an another metaphor is like the word to or and. Um, maybe you're that person that kind of helps bring everything together, right? You kind of bring all the ideas together. So, um, so those are a couple of the ideas behind this exercise. So again, thanks again uh, for participating or, or being kind of voluntold. Um, <laughs> thanks. All right. Let's go on here. So the other thing we want to talk about now is the curse of knowledge, right? So um, there are, um, you know, as you can see on the slide here, it's kind of this cognitive bias that we all struggle with, right? Because we're really close um, to, to, the, to, to what we do, right? And sometimes it's hard for us to see it from the perspective of someone who doesn't, right? So this term was actually coined back in 1989 in the Journal of Political Economy, of all places, by some economists. And so um, they first applied the curse of knowledge phenomenon to economics in order to explain why and how the assumption that better informed agents can accurately anticipate the judgments of lesser informed agents is not inherently true. And the reason is said to be that better informed agents fail to ignore the privileged knowledge that they possess and are thus cursed and kind of unable to sell their products um, at a value that more naive agents would deem acceptable. Okay, so just a little bit of background. Um, so we're going to explore this with another quick little exercise here. So um, this time I do need to ask for some volunteer, two volunteers. Okay, the one. Um, Somebody who who understands the uh, the game of baseball, okay? Just a basic understanding. You don't have to be like a rabid fan, but someone uh, who understands the game of baseball. Anybody, uh, any any volunteers to kind of be our, our uh, kind of stand in as our SME uh, for baseball? Anybody? Oh, Kyle, right on. Thanks, Thanks Kyle. Kyle. <laughs> All right. And now we need the opposite. You know, somebody who knows very little about uh, the game of baseball. If, uh, you just I can do raise it. Your hand. Okay, Vicki. All right. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Vicki, if you could turn on your camera as well. 
So what I'm, I'd like to ask you both to do, uh, Kyle and Vicky, is you're both going to read the next slide. Uh, Kyle, your, your, um, your job is uh, kind of laid out in the last sentence there. And, um, and then Vicky, feel free to ask as many questions as you'd like as Kyle tries to um, do his job as a subject matter expert. Okay. <laughs> All right. So here we go. And whenever you're ready, Kyle, you can start. Okay, so the situation in the game is that this could potentially be a game-winning decision. It is quite probably the last thing that is going to happen in the game. Uh, these are two teams that have a long-standing rivalry, and the next pitch of the ball, the, the next throw by the pitcher, is going to decide what happens, because either the, the batter is going to hit the ball, and we may see some change to the score, or the batter will miss the ball, and the game will end. And those outcomes will determine who wins the game. So you've got these two very rabid fan bases who are present watching this game. And everyone is just hanging on what happens next. The anticipation is palpable. It is electric, to put it mildly. Do you have any questions? And are, and are you excited, Vicky? I am now after hearing what you said. When I read this, I was like, I have, I don't even know what an inning is. So I was going to ask you to divine that for me, but, <laughs> but now I'm excited. Okay, cool, cool. All right. All right. Well, let's, let's give each other, give them a hand. Okay. Um, nice job, Kyle. Thank um, you. Yeah. I got to say that things. was a very good description for me. Yeah, you described yeah. it well, why I should be excited. Uh, yeah. Um, what was, what I, what we usually touch on here that, um, you know, it usually doesn't go that well. <laughs> and uh, what we tend to touch on here is is setting some context, which I think you did very well, Kyle. Um, and then also, um, you know, of uh, you know the the jargon, right? So uh, to Vicky's point, you know, what's an inning? You know, what are bases loaded? Um, what's a plate? Right? What's a full count? Right? So. Um, because as subject matter experts, sometimes we understand those things. So we, so we put them in, right. And we think everybody's going to get it. Um, and so uh, those are the kind of things that we usually touch on here. And then again, of course, the potential excitement. And, um, and I think Kyle did a good job um, with the context and the excitement and um, didn't really through his explanation, didn't really have to touch on any of the jargon, right. It still came across uh, to Vicky. So um so nice again. Thanks, thanks for uh, volunteering. And again, just a couple things to keep in mind is you know setting some context and then try to be as jargon free as possible. All right. Um, the next thing we want to touch on here a little bit is complexity. Okay, and so this comes from our friends over at Pixar. And um, so Andrew Stanton here, um, he started understanding this kind of storytelling device when he was writing uh, with his writing partner on Finding Nemo. We're gonna talk a little bit about Finding Nemo uh, here in a minute. And he kind of called this the unifying theory of two plus two. So as we talked earlier, right, about being curious, about trying to fill in information, right? Um, kind of make the audience put things together. Don't give them four, give them two plus two. And uh, again, we're born problem solvers. We're compelled to deduce and deduct because that's what we do in real life. And so, as we talked about a little bit earlier, the elements you provide and the order you place them in is crucial to whether you succeed or fail at engaging the audience, okay? And so a couple things about this is, um, you know, the more complicated your information, the simpler your language should be. Um, don't dump a load of facts, right? Deliver the most essential information in a way that interests them and makes them want to know more. 
Okay, so so we're not saying um, you can't talk about the complexity of your idea or your concept, but you just don't want to lead with that, right? You kind of want to bring folks along. And so, again, with the story spine is the way that um, Disney and Pixar and a lot of these storytelling uh, communities uh, kind of frame things about the flow is kind of move from simple to complex, from familiar to unfamiliar, right? So setting some of that context. Um, start with the basics and then gently introduce some complexity. And um, and you really are the person responsible, right, for how well the other person kind of follows you along, okay? So here's kind of a, a, a simple uh, maybe way to look at this. So um, you could say this, I'm studying Didymosphenia geminata, an invasive species known to impair the recreational and ecological values of waterways and native species, okay? Or you could try a way that maybe is a little more sticky. Um, here we go. Uh, I study rock snot. Um, this is a kind of algae that forms brown oozing masses that resemble a sewage spill. They grow so large they can block streams and kill fish. Rock snot is an invasive species, meaning it comes from outside the region and harms the local balance of nature. Its scientific name is Didymosphenia geminata. Okay, so again, just a different way to try to think or, or a way to try to think differently about how you might want to try to explain your idea and your concept. Okay. And then just another note is, um, you know, these banks of prior knowledge. So you know, the brain relies on two sources of information to un try to understand something new, right? Your source material, but also these banks of prior knowledge, right? What that person may already think about your idea or your concept. So uh, an example of this is when we were working on a heliophysics um, concept called Sunrise, which, which got awarded. And um, at the time, we were going to use some small sats, right? What we called a loose constellation of small sats. And this was early on when small sats were starting to kind of enter the, the ecosystem of, of space exploration. And so a lot of folks just didn't think they could do real science. And so we had to combat that in our writing, right? And a couple of things that, excuse me, we kind of asked ourselves was, you know, this so what, now what kind of approach. So what might be the predisposition of the selection official towards your concept? Now, what kind of you know, story or specific subject matter are you gonna put in there to kind of satisfy or overcome that position, right? Um, another thing to think about is your concept's death threats, right? So what are the things out there that, you know, we kind of call this putting on your black hat, right? What are the things out there that can really kill your idea, right? So think about that with your team. You know, what are some of those weaknesses, right? And are you, how, what are you doing to overcome those? And then also, you know, there may be other folks out there um, doing the same type of work. So what, what are those discriminators? What are those differences that make your idea kind of stand out, right? Okay. Um, another really important thing, and um, I'm sure Christina touched on this, was was getting uh, feedback, right? Um, so seek it out, embrace it. Think of feedback as making something greater than one person can make it. So our friends over at Disney call this plussing. And uh, the way they define plussing is it's in service of the trajectory of the idea or message, okay? So a great example of this is the first Star Wars, right? A New Hope. And we'll go back to February 1977. Uh, George Lucas uh, screens the current version of the entire film to a couple of his friends, uh, Francis Ford Coppola, Steven Spielberg, Brian De Palma. And uh, in the film industry, they kind of say a film is written three times. First as the screenplay, next when they're actually you know in production, shooting and, and stuff. And then finally in the edit. And so... What his friends brought to him as their feedback was um, there was a bloated first act. So they suggested cutting tons of material um, to create clarity. They, they restructured scenes and entire sequences all in the spirit of propelling the story forward. So just a few months later, 
from February. Now we're May 25th, 1977. Star Wars A New Hope is released, right? And and the rest is history. So um, always seek out feedback from a variety of folks, right? Maybe some, some peers, um, maybe some folks outside of your uh, specialty, right? And, um, and, and to get some feedback to really make your story um, as good as it can be. Okay. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, this, this little exercise um, to help get your core story. Okay. This comes from our friends over at, at Pixar. And so um, what, what Pixar has uh, discovered, and you may, you may recognize this, um, is this deep structure of storytelling, right? Once upon a time there was every day, one day, because of that, because of that, until finally. And so they use this as a way to vet um, initial ideas for maybe a new short or a full, full length, you know, animated feature. Because they're trying to reach the stakeholders from the boardroom to the playground, right? So we're gonna go back to Nemo. Um, uh, I think maybe most folks have seen the film uh, Finding Nemo. Um, I have kids, so I've seen it a lot. Um, and so this is the six sentence template that um, Emma Coates, uh, who was a Pixar story artist at the time, uh, presented to uh, talk about her idea for this new film. Okay, so I'm just going to put all six sentences up there and you all can just kind of read through them here real quick. And I think when you get done with number six, um, I, I think you'll agree that this is the basic story, right? This is the core story of the film. So we, we so myself, um, I said, gosh, how can we maybe use this formula to help our teams um, you know, it was kind of zero in on their core story um, as they move through developing their proposal. And so um, we, we kind of wanted to go from scientist to stakeholder, right? So here's the way we kind of framed it. And, and, and Christina uh, probably mentioned this idea of, you know, what is the current state of the art? What's your idea and how you're going to advance it? So that's the framework that we, we broke this up in. So once upon a time, there was an every day is kind of the current state of the art. One day is your idea, how things could change. And because of that, you're going to advance the state of the art until finally we're going to have that new knowledge uh, to feed back into the community. Okay. So let's take a quick look at an example. So another effort that I worked on was, was SURFA. And um, so this was going to be an earth observing satellite. Um, from space to look at the cryosphere and try to understand the accelerated melt, right? And what was contributing to that. Uh, this is with uh, Dr. Thomas Painter was the PI. Okay, so here's the way we approach the six sentence template. So once upon a time, there was melting in the Earth's cryosphere at alarming rates, moving enormous volumes of stored water from frozen state to liquid, raising sea level rise and changing water availability to large populations. Every day, many studies showed a clear link between decreased surface reflectance or albedo and increased melt, but a poor understanding of why. One day, a scientist thought, what if we use proven airborne instruments from space to collect global measurements of the cryosphere while it melts? Because of that, an investigation to improve our understanding of cryosphere melt processes was developed. Because of that, better data will feel, sorry, will feed current cryosphere models to enable improved predictions of future changes to Earth's cryosphere. Until finally, this improved understanding leads to actions that result in protecting and sustaining humankind. So the way we do this uh, with teams is, um, we, we give this prompt, right, the six sentences, give them about 10 minutes to think about it, and we give them a stack of stickies, pen, and we ask them to write each sentence on one sticky. We then um, go to the whiteboard and we, we create, you know, some columns for the six sentences, and as we're done, each team member one by one comes up and reads their stickies, right? 
until we have something that looks like this. And a couple things usually happen. Um, number one, their stories are quite different. They're, you know, even though these teams have been working together for a while, as you read across the six, there's a little bit of discrepancy between each one of those rows. It's good, you know, we can kind of find out and, and, and synthesize, synthesize those and make them into one core story. But then also you may identify um, maybe someone who's looked at it pretty in a pretty creative way and that maybe that person could take the first cut at writing, you know, that upfront section to help build that emotional investment, okay? Um, so I know we only have about 10 minutes or so left, but what I'd like to do is um, just, if, if, you, if you could, um, think about something you're currently working on, right? And, um, and, and apply this, okay, to, you know, try this exercise um, with yourself, maybe with, with your team. And, uh, and then maybe you could share it back with uh, Margot and, and Pubali and others and, uh, and get some feedback. Um, we don't have enough time to kind of do it here in our session together, but you can see this as a little bit of homework, okay, as to a way to kind of, like I said, kind of frame your story. And then maybe that is something that can then be refined into an elevator pitch. And then maybe your executive summary or your upfront section to your proposal. Okay, so in closing, you know, storytelling may seem like an old fashioned <laughs> uh, thing, um, and it is, and that's what makes it so powerful. You know, we've kind of touched on how we're sort of hardwired uh, for story, and, um, you know, story definitely can go places that, uh, you know, quantitative data cannot, and that's to the heart. So, um, so that's what I had for today. Um, and thank you so much uh, for hanging out. And I can hand it back over to uh, Ubali or uh, Margo. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much. Uh, storytelling in, in proposal writing, I mean, these two words go hand in hand. But exactly how it can go hand in hand, I don't think uh, at least I being a naive had no clue that these two can go hand in hand and we need to understand how to collect, uh, connect the dots. It was really fascinating, especially engaging the participants and forcing them to think that uh, how our brain is hardwired to do things and connect things, even though so, the subconsciously we are doing that. It was really fascinating. So if uh, any of the participants have any questions or anything, maybe we have a few minutes. So, and uh, we would really thank you on behalf of uh, Women Mentoring Women team, GRSS IDEA. Thank you so much for doing this for with us. It sure, was really fascinating. Sure. Yeah, I know. And if you have any questions, that, that's awesome. And then I can also um, send you uh, the deck to distribute. Yeah, sure, sure. We'll do that. And from the participants, so do you guys have any questions for Paul? We have a few minutes left, so if you guys have, I think we have one in chat. Uh, How to um, thin, oh, think about innovation sorry, or novelty. Um, well, yeah, so again, I know a lot of times, right, you're maybe doing something new, right, innovative, um, and, and there may be some some risk in that or, or perceived risk, right? So again, I think, you know, thinking about how others may think about it um, can help you shape how to write about it. And um, so I know we deal with this a lot on the big mission proposals because there's this dichotomy of we want new innovative ideas, but we also want low risk, <laughs> you know, and, and we want a lot of heritage, you know, we, we want things that are at a certain um technology readiness level or TRL. And if they're not at a certain TRL, then you got to tell us why and what your plan is to get it up to that TRL um, by a certain gate um, once you start building your actual mission or project. And um, so that would be my advice is, is kind of try to think about it from the reviewer's shoes and then also help them understand, you know, 
any kind of uh, testing or uh, risk mitigation activities you've done uh, to help kind of ease their their concerns about your your idea. Oh, how lengthy can a proposal be? Yeah, and, and that depends on the call. So <clears throat> traditionally, these um, ROSES proposals, right, or, or RNA proposals from headquarters, I think they're 15 pages. And, um, and there is some, a little bit of a prescribed outline as to how they want you to talk about stuff. And, um, and so that's where kind of the visuals can come in too, is, you know, in order to, get an idea across, right? Pictures worth a thousand words kind of thing, you know, is, is to try not to have that 15 pages be all text, try to, try to insert as many visuals or tables to kind of break it up, but then also that convey your, your idea and your concept at the same time. But normally they're about 15 pages. The larger um, mission proposals, like a, um, usually the step one is usually two to 250, um, depending on how they break it up. And uh, so those are a couple. Sometimes you can be a five pager as well. So, um, so there's various links depending on the call. Um, let me just see customer prescriptive. Yep. Okay. So, um, sorry. So yeah, the the, the prescription, right? So, um, again. You know, sometimes you're right. It says like you've only got, you know, 10 pages to talk about your science and, you know, five pages to talk about, um, you know, X, Y, or Z. And so, unfortunately, you kind of got to live in those constraints. Um, and again, um, you know, as, as you said here, you know, consider the reviewer's standpoint. So you, you, you've got to just try to, again, connect all those different sections so just because it says, you know, science is here for, 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 you know, 10 pages, it, you know, you, you want to make sure that that connects when you're talking about your technical approach, right. Which may be, you know, more pages, right. A lot of times it is. Um, and, and think about kind of clever ways to, again, illustrate your ideas to work within those constraints. Um, so just being creative and then, then again, getting that feedback from, folks who have done this before, right? And say, hey, do you think this is hanging together? You know, could I move something from here over to here because it's got more pages? So you, you, you kind of have to uh, um, work within those constraints, but maybe try to mold them in a way that benefits your idea and your story. Yeah, so scientific papers, you know, they're, I would say yes, um, but but you know they traditionally tend to, uh, you know, if you look at the outlines, and um, I know that's part of our full workshop, uh, Christina and I, where um, Christina actually compares, you know, a technical paper outline versus you know a proposal outline, and um, the the challenge there is normally with a technical, you know, your big idea and your and 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 all the cool stuff is at the end, <laughs> and so you know it 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 would be it's good to flip that. Um, you know, the, the old pyramid, right. And, uh, and give them all the good compelling stuff up front. So I think you can. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. And thank you everyone for your sure. questions. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know, kind of remind everyone that there is one more session in this workshop. So next week at the same time, um, there will be a panel discussion. So we have a few more people coming in, some experts on proposal writing um, in the field. And this is your chance to kind of ask more, more specific questions. So we'll send out an email to everybody that registered uh, with a bit more information on that as well. Um, but uh, overall, really, thank you, Paul. That was okay. really, really great. And just another reminder, please sign the attendance form. It's in the chat. Um, the reason for that is those who attend all the all three sessions will receive an IEEE uh, accredited certificate. So just make sure you sign that to receive that certificate. Um, all right. Uh, I have a question. Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry. sorry Paul, uh, can we get these slides? Uh, because you know, the, the, yes. there is a lot of information. Yes. So absolutely. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and best, 
best of luck to to you all in in your in your yeah, proposal thanks, journey. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Thank you, all right. Paul. Really appreciate it. Have sure. a good bye night. Bye. Thank you. Yep. Have a good night. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Great. Okay. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye, Pavali. Yeah. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.